So what is post-industrial design? The use of that concept, the concept of the post-industrial, is already 100 years old. The term post-industrialism appears in 1917. It is actually from a socialist perspective, point of view, that architect Arthur Pentry argues in a 1922 published book for a return to a guild society based on crafts and small business. This is done, of course, at a time when the model of the so-called big business is in place. Think of the Rockefeller, the trusts, the multinationals that actually are starting to be established at that time. The return to the manageable dimensions of pre-industrial machinery with its economically and socially small space structures, as well as a focus on small communities, is actually what's at stake. Of course, this is opposed to the anonymity of the masses, and that, of course, is what describes a fundamental current in the usage of the concept of the post-industrial since its first occurrence. Now, with the sociologist and journalist uh, Daniel Bell in his 1974 book, The Coming of Post-Industrial Society, the term will, project it, will be projected into the future as a forecast. It's very interesting because Bell basically identified following major shifts uh, of our time. So, the economy undergoes a transition from the production of goods to the provision of services. That's the first one. The second one. Now, knowledge becomes a valued form of capital. Three, producing ideas is the main way to grow the economy. Four, globalization now sets the tone. The blue-collar unionized work and of course I'm talking also about manual labor, for example, assembly line work and so on, declines. Professional workers, for example, scientists, creative industry professionals, IT professionals and so on, grow now in value and importance. And number five, behavioral and information sciences and technologies are developed and fully implemented. Think of behavioral economics, cybernetics, game theory and information theory in general. 30 years after Bell, in 2005, Richard Florida identifies a fundamental shift in our contemporary, contemporary structure of society. Now, the importance of creativity grows in people's work lives. A class of people unified by their engagement in creative work also emerges. Millions of us are starting now to work and live much as creative types like artists and scientists actually always had. This so-called creative class now determines how the workplace is organized, what companies would prosper or go bankrupt, and even which cities are going to thrive and flourish. Uh, this is the so-called creative class which, according to Florida, actually accounts for one-third of people in American and European cities. And there is one, let's say, guiding principle behind that. We can talk about the triple T, technology, tolerance and talent. This is actually what guides this kind of like uh, creative class. Now, following another type of critique coming from a different perspective, it is actually Michael Hart and Antonio Negri that talk, who talk about this new form of labor and describe it in the form of dematerialized services or as so-called immaterial labor. What is that? Well, that means to work with information, with symbols, language and affects without directly graspable material results, without actually producing goods in a material understanding of the term. This is an attribute of information producers 
and of course information consumers uh, to whom we all belong. Post Fordist immaterial labor is generally communicative, affective and of course cooperative. Philosopher Ivan Illich had a major impact in the discussion about the future of labor within a society in the process of post-industrialization. He has also commented upon how we are supposed to live with technology. Uh, he uses the term post-industrial in uh, two polemics, two books. The one is called Tools of Conviviality, 1973, and Dishooling Society in 1972. He discusses so-called convivial tools. Illich describes conviviality as a life-affirming interaction with technology. Through conviviality, Illich demands the life-sustaining, life-affirming use of technology. Sustainability aims at an ecological, autonomous and humane interaction with technology. And for Illich, this is only possible if tools follow human standards and not the other way around. They need to be able to be understood, repaired and modified. They need to be able to be used individually or in small groups. They need to fit society in socially, ecologically and economically way. For example, and basically in general it means to be sustainable in all dimensions, for example, ecological thinking and so on. Now, there are other social scientists, actually contemporary uh, um, researchers, for example, Bernd Sommer and Harald Welzer, who speak uh, of the necessity of a so-called reductive modernity. So clearly, the discussion about post-industrialism relates also to the discussion about the, let's say, the development of modernity. Now, these two researchers in a book published in 2014, uh, and the book has the title, very interesting title, Transformation Design, argue for the following, for a change. Now, this change, however, presupposes the willingness to undo uh, our own privileges, at least, and of course that refers to people among those who had so far their share of the achievements of an expansive modernity on others' people's course. Who are they? The marginalized of today in the global south and of course future generations. We need to reduce material demands. This is what the authors argue about. We need to prioritize different values. We need to change economic practices in different areas of our living, of our life, nutrition, mobility, for example, labor, leisure time, and so on. So in this regard, a post-industrial economy deals often, clearly, with alternative modes of co-production recently posed by the alter-globalization movement. Uh, they relate to issues such as the commons, degrowth, low-tech technologies, redistribution, and of course work beyond the classical understanding of wage labor. Post-industrial design can be understood as an interdisciplinary practice, an interdisciplinary discipline as well, which orients itself towards the challenging and changing topic areas of the post-industrial society, of the post-industrial condition. Thus, and that's of course very important, there is no, let's say, clear or specific focus on a certain market, as for example, if you talk about design, let's say, you think about, let's say, fashion design. Uh, also, there is no focus on a certain media communicative area, for example, visual communication or media and interaction design. That's a clear understanding of, of an area. And also there is no focus on a, let's say, on a specific output. If you think, for example, on, of uh, industrial design. All right. There is another kind of emphasis, and the emphasis there is on the experimental development of an interdisciplinary 
uh, response to newly arising questions regarding basically uh, social transformations. Post-industrial design, therefore, always has to mean process design. Uh, one's own actions have to be understood as processes and the task of design as acting within these processes. No machine is convivial per se, no collective is manageable per se and forever, and no service sustainable by design can be guaranteed to be sustainable in use again. Under a post-industrial self-understanding, the individual and the design team, of course, are constantly forced to develop their own positions to the concrete problems at hand in and during the work process. Which is to say that post-industrial design work orients itself towards artistic strategies. Post-industrial design moves within the relations of the service industry, however, it can often actually go beyond those rules. Post-industrial allows for the development of novel ideas and concepts regarding, for example, the future of work. Post-industrial design might also mean actually to offer possibilities to invent this new work. Now, this understanding leads from theory to, number one, speculative objects, number two, narratives, and number three, exemplary, instructive, and successful experiences and good practices. These, we can call them practically implemented experiments with uh, their own theoretical foundations, are action-relevant applied concepts. They flow back into theory to further develop it. Design research is thus understood as a production of knowledge in dialogue with cultural studies, for example, and of course relevant disciplines. Post-industrial design, it's actually an applied theory of change. Post-industrial design in this regard might be also the only possible way we still have to think about our society, uh, think about the future of our world and possibly make an effort to change it and make it better.